Good morning, my seniors, or whatever time you're actually watching this. Welcome back, guys. I hope you really enjoyed your Easter, and I hope you spent a lot of time with your families despite the whole coronavirus outbreak. Today we're going to keep up with our Civil Liberties unit. We're actually getting close to the conclusion of Civil Liberties just because of time's sake. But today is going to be all about for freedom of security, specifically when it comes to the Second Amendment. But before we even talk about the Second Amendment, a question for you guys, because really depending on how you answer is really going to change the whole dynamics of this section. Do you think the government should have rights to keep you or anyone else from buying a firearm for your own personal protection? Why or why not? If you ultimately say no, then obviously the rest of this you're not going to really like, and honestly that's okay. You guys have free will. You make the judgment calls. Um, I'm just going to be presenting today more of what the law looks like right now, as well as what it's looked like historically. If that changes, then obviously I'll change it for next year's seniors or whoever. Anywho, so today we're going to be talking about freedom of security in person uh, and this whole concept of self-preservation, which is just simply the ability to protect yourself from harm or death. Now, there's a lot of different forms of self-preservation. Like if I was talking about the 13th Amendment, do I honestly need to go and talk about how illegal slavery is? Of course, you have the right to defend yourself from that. It's in the 13th Amendment. So I'm going to go more specifically on one that's a little bit more applicable today, and that's the right to keep and bear arms. Now, the Second Amendment is one of the most scrutinized amendments in our Constitution, especially with how the media is today, and especially with how all these tragic events have happening in our nation whether it be the Las Vegas shooting, whether it be Stoneman Douglas, whether it be Sandy Hook, San Bernardino, etc. I can go on and on, and they're all very, very tragic. Um, and honestly, we should be praying for those people still even today because they're still impacted by those things. But legally speaking, what does the Second Amendment give? What does it allow? And what did our founders actually mean by this? And these are all very important questions to ask. Because if you haven't really known, noticed throughout this, your rights are very, very specific as well as very, very vague. And they're meant ultimately to be your rights. And if you don't ultimately know the specifics about your rights, then people are ultimately going to take them away from you. There's a reason why you need to have your rights read to you, the Miranda rights, when you're being arrested. It's because if you don't know them, they're going to be taken away from you. Uh, the same thing to be said with freedom of religion, speech, all these are kind of under constant attack. And the lack of knowledge is going to be bad for you, which is why I'm informing you of them all. Again, I'm just kind of showing it to you black and white what it is specifically now. And then if it changes in the future, obviously I'll change it for those seniors. But just showing you guys specifically what it is. So let's look at the text of the Second Amendment. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. So what were our founding fathers thinking? Well, if we look at the Constitution word for word, we got to obviously start with the first thing it talks about, which is a well-regulated militia. Which, if you're thinking of the word militia, you probably would think very much state militias. However, a lot of people think that this amendment also sets out an individual right to keep and bear arms, the right of the people to bear those arms. So which one is it? Is it the militias or for the people? Well, I can tell you one thing. It's not for the militias. So just like a magic conch cell, now start off with the phrase, the right of the people. This amendment is specifically granting a right only to the people. Otherwise, the founding fathers would have spe specified that it was the government getting the right to do something specifically. The whole point of a Bill of Rights is to tell out what the people's rights are, not the government's. The government has all of their power in the articles, not the amendments. So this may make you think that, okay, then obviously the founders were splitting the Second Amendment into two parts, something specifically about the militia and something specifically about people, kind of like how they did with freedom of religion. But that isn't true either. Legally speaking, what the first part of the Second Amendment is, is known as a justification clause. It basically is a statement that tries to justify the statement that proceeds afterwards. I'll give you an example. Because I love all of you guys, I'm going to give you all a gift for your graduation. 
notice the justification clause. At the beginning it says, because I love you guys. And then you have the operative clause, which is what I'm going to do. So the justification for the Second Amendment is a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. Notice the key word is a free state. Not a safe state, but a free state. More on that later. Plus, think of it this way. What was a militia even back then? You can't use modern-day definitions for terms and then define it in the 18th century. So we got to figure out what a militia means to our founding fathers. And the best way to do that is to find some type of document that defines militia by them during that time period. Closest thing we have is the Militia Act of 1792, which defined a militia as all white males 18 through 45. And to kind of put in perspective, the life expectancy in America was about 38 back then, so it basically meant all adults. Clearly not a reference to a small National Guard that meets in Tallahassee or some type of secret police. The founders were saying pretty much everyone. And then you have something known as the operative clause, which is the whole point of the statement. The justification clause justifies the operative clause, which explains what right is being secured. The right is for the people to keep and bear arms. So what does that ultimately mean? A well-regulated militia, all able-bodied males essentially, females your time will come, being necessary for a free state, not a safe state, we would have been plenty safe under the British, just not free, the right of the people to bear arms shall not be infringed. And this right is ultimately for you guys, and it's for basically two different reasons. The first is, as we pointed out, it keeps the government in check and ultimately keeps you guys free. Um, at the end of the day, we have about a million soldiers in our army and navy and air force and stuff, and that is a lot of people, but there's 360 plus million people in the United States, so... I'd pick the people at that point, uh, not that I want either to fight either. But that leaves a second reason with a question mark, which is what we're going to talk about next, which is the security of your home and person. So with the ability to own a firearm, what does the law say about usage when it comes to firearms and for your security for like your home? But before we even get anywhere into what the law says, why would I even need to exercise this right, Mr. Shung? Well, the reality is I hope you never have to. But if you do find yourself in a situation like this, it's good to know where your rights are and where you are legally speaking before you make any kind of decision. Um, there are some circumstances where the police will just not get to a situation in time, and at that point you might be the adult who has to present an answer to a situation. But if you get that answer wrong, there could be some really serious legal ramifications waiting for you on the other side. The old saying is, there's a lawyer for every bullet. More on this later. So questions some of you have asked me, just short and sweet. Uh, so constitutionally speaking, about the Second Amendment. Now, when it comes to historical sense, there's only been really two big important cases for the Second Amendment in the Supreme Court. You have D.C. versus Heller, which we've already learned about. And then you have United States versus Miller, which happened back in the 30s. This case involved a section of a recently passed law known as the National Firearms Act, which forbids the shipping of sawed-off shotguns, suppressors, and machine guns across state lines without informing the Treasury Department, paying a tax, and there's a lot more to it, but that's just the short summary of it. That case, they upheld the provision in the National Firearms Act, which is why you don't see people running around with any of those things. Sawed-off shotguns, suppressors, machine guns. Yes, including machine guns. No one can freely get one of those despite a Second Amendment. Also, despite what you might hear in the news, machine guns are different from rifles. But that's a discussion for a different day. So, the Second Amendment, though, has as of yet not been extended to each state under the 14th Amendment, which, short summary without reading the amendment, means that states have the right to regulate firearms in their own ways. More on this later. Question, what is it like to go through the process? I heard it's super simple, like buying a car. Kind of, but not really. People with criminal records don't get denied car ownership, although bad credit score, different story. Car buyers don't have to go through a background check. Car owners don't have to register a car and keep it on their property, and if it goes off their property, they could be arrested. There's no state bans on any specific type of car, unless you're in California with those very weird smog emissions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, Okay, not like a car, but what is it like? Basically, you go through a background check, you clear several databases on the federal, state, and local level, 
you have a waiting period, could be a week, could be longer, depends your state. And if it all comes back green, you're good to go. Um, the biggest thing is obviously it's not as simple as going to Walmart, taking your cart and picking one out. There are some serious regulations when it comes to firearms. Question, what age do I need to acquire a pistol or rifle? Short summary, the federal law states that you must reach the age of 18 in order to own a rifle. Background checks and state laws still apply. And for handguns, it's 21. Uh, the reason why they chose 21 to be higher is because 80% of gun-related homicides and crimes all relate to a handgun versus a rifle. But can I own a musket, though? For the one senior that's asking, kind of. It's more considered an antique or a relic, so unless the ATF specifically defines it as something that the public should not have without a background check, it actually might be something good to go. However, state laws still apply. Can I buy one online? Not really. You can order a gun online, but it'll still be shipped to an FFL, which is a federal firearms licensed dealer, which is basically a gun store, and you basically have to go through the same process as everyone else, albeit it's even more time at that point. So there's some questions answered as far as how to obtain. Let's talk about specifically stuff like Castle Doctrine. So Castle Doctrine, which is something most people got wrong on their pre-assessment, it's the doctrine in the United States that gives you the ability to protect your legal habitation by use of force. Basically, the short summary would be something like this. If I saw a king named King Caleb Gertson and someone invaded his kingdom, how would King Caleb Gertson respond? I'll, I'll let Caleb, you know, answer that one. So you have the ability to defend your home, your car, stuff like that. It's called defend your castle, essentially. Question, what is stand your ground? Well, this is something in Florida and several other states. A person who is in dwelling or residence in which the person has a right to be has no duty to retreat and has the right to stand his or her ground and use or threaten to use. So basically, if someone invades your home, you have the right to stand your ground. You don't have to run away. You could literally present force with force if you need to. Uh, does this include deadly force? Yes. Deadly force if he or she reasonably believes that using or threatening to use such force is necessary to prevent imminent death or great bodily harm to himself or herself or another or to prevent the imminent commission of a forcible felony. So if you find yourself in that situation, keep in mind the legal ramifications of all this stuff. Should you have to exercise this right, which again, I hope none of you guys have to, the police, once they show up on scene, will ask you if you had to use like deadly force. They'll basically ask something along the lines of, did you have to kill that guy? And if it answers anything less than yes, that you were in fear of your life, guess who's going to jail? You. Because now you're a suspect of homicide at that point. Now, question. Does this apply to gun-free zones? Castle Doctrine, stand your ground, not applicable to gun-free zones. Private properties and businesses can post if they want to be a gun-free zone. Stuff like schools, government buildings, hospitals are just automatically gun-free zones. Now, one of those gun-free zones involves schools, and some of you guys are going into university next year, and some of you guys will be leaving the state, and some of you guys probably are wondering, do these rights extend to you when you're out there? Well, universities are exempt from gun-free zones, but they can create their own policies, meaning they can have it. Uh, interesting enough, if you go to a school in Florida, though, there's a little bit of a contradiction going on with Florida law at the moment. Uh, a couple years ago, Governor Rick Scott signed a law in response to Stoneman Douglas, which raised the age to, of rifles to 21 and also made a mandatory waiting period for all firearm transactions and then a little bit more lengthier. Now, this is Florida passing a law in order to regulate firearms. Now, is that constitutional? Can Florida just go around and change what a federal law states? Well, at the end of the day, when it comes to this, this leads to a very, very interesting discussion of a state literally taking a federal law, which we now know what the Second Amendment is for, and there are a ton of federal laws out there, whether it be rifle ages, pistol ages, etc., but Florida just passed a law saying we're not going to follow that. Can Florida just do something like that? The answer, in short, is no. Like the Magic Conscious says, no, because the Supremacy Clause is still the Supremacy Clause. However, firearms is not the only thing states have gone around and went against federal laws. Thursday we'll be talking about more of those, but I'll give you a hint. Think Colorado. And at the end of the day, guys, this is just scratching the surface. I could go on and on talking about whether this amendment should be amended. Times have definitely changed. 
but that's a discussion for you guys through an assignment or an email if you wish.